Community and faith leaders in Southern California are demanding answers from a local school board about the National Suicide Hotline. The hotline is allegedly referring students who indicate confusion about their gender identity to a controversial LGBT advocacy organization. On Tuesday, a group of community leaders called on school board trustees in Santa Ana Unified School District to investigate a program called the Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is an organization that provides confidential crisis support services to LGBT youth via text, chat, or calls. Many critics have been skeptical of both the impact and intentions of the organization and its affiliated chat rooms, which are open to 13 to 24-year-old LGBT youth. They allege that the chat rooms can be easily accessed by anyone and is a breeding ground for sexual predators. Sarah Aguilar, a youth leader and psychology major, has accused the Trevor Project of supporting perversion in its affiliated Trevor Space chat rooms by allegedly allowing children to discuss a wide range of sexual topics and fetishes. Pronto posible. Gracias. I believe the mental health of our children and youth is very important. Our Hispanic community respects and trusts those in authority. However, they do not send their children to school to be indoctrinated or sexualized. Most kids are more savvy in technology than their parents. It is wrong that these mental health crisis lines use technology to indoctrinate and sexualize. John Palacio, a trustee, suggested that the board should investigate the complaints. But Rigo Rodriguez, the school board president, disagreed and objected to the, quote, dehumanizing and disgusting language that he says was directed towards LGBT students. Vice President of the board, Caroline Torres, also denounced the concerns of many parents and dismissed Trevor Space as a fake site unaffiliated with the organization. But according to the website, the Trevor Project promotes Trevor Space along with Trevor Chat, Trevor Lifeline, and other services. California's four-year-old legal marijuana market is in disarray. The Attorney General says the state will try a new approach to disrupting the illegal pot farms. California will expand its nearly four-decade-old multi-agency seasonal marijuana eradication program called Campaign Against Marijuana Planting, or CAMP. It's the nation's largest, and this year it scooped up nearly a million marijuana plants. Starting this fall, the state will turn the program into a year-round task force called Eradication and Prevention of Illicit Cannabis, or EPIC, aimed at investigating who is behind the illegal grows. Today we are announcing that this year our camp teams conducted 449 operations. We eradicated nearly 1 million illegally cultivated cannabis plants and more than 200,000 pounds of processed cannabis. We seized and recovered 184 firearms, the largest number in recent memory, and we removed more than 67,000 pounds of cultivation infrastructure, including dams, water lines, and toxic chemicals. Since 1983, the 13-week program has been conducted across 26 counties. Bonta said Tuesday that the new program will attempt to prosecute underlying labor crimes, environmental crimes, and the underground economy centered around illicit cultivation. The illegal cultivation of marijuana on the public lands causes great damage to plant and wildlife resources. It poses a danger to our visitors and pollutes sensitive areas with hazardous chemicals. Bonta says these sites are also areas for human trafficking. Online shopping. Most everyone seems to be buying their products this way now. But to get those next day deliveries requires a lot of land for warehouses. And that means someone else is giving up theirs. NTD's Jackie Rios went to hear both sides of the story. With almost everyone shopping online now and wanting their packages delivered as soon as possible, that costs for a lot of warehouse space, but that takes up land, and in this case, farmland. We talked to several farmers in Ontario to hear what they think. One of those farmers is Pedro Rojo Tavares. He owns Rojo Farms in Southern California, San Bernardino County, where he's worked the land for close to 20 years and watched all the changes. 
I am Furlington, lo que es Furlington. What's Fullerton in Anaheim? We used to work on the fields there. Right now, I believe there aren't places over there to harvest because now it's only warehouses and factories. So we all moved over here, but now they're doing the same thing. So they're pushing us to places where the land is no good to grow any produce. Rojo Tavares said the solution is not as simple as picking up and moving due to being acclimated to the land in high costs. Moving creates more expenses and there aren't people to work the land, so we put in more money but we won't be able to move forward. But on the other side, massive fulfillment centers are being built simply to meet consumer demand. That's especially so when serving the roughly 18 and a half million people in the greater Los Angeles area. So we go to where the customer demand is, right? So our fulfillment centers and our delivery stations are located where we have the most demand. Eileen Hartz gave a tour of one of the facilities in the neighboring city of Eastvale. So we have about a little over 3,000 employees here and the building's a little bit over a million square feet. On top of that, the new warehouses also happen to be not far from two of the busiest ports in the nation, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. But despite all the new development, other farmers have a pragmatic view about new customers in the area. Yes, a lot of people that get off from work come and buy everything fresh that they see, they take. So that benefits us, the farmer, that there are a lot of warehouses, so more people stop by and they end up buying. Though Isarara said more people in the area means more customers to shop at his stand, he's realistic about land being limited. No, there's less land, and it's being used for warehouses, houses, stores, and agriculture is almost done here. More and more of the land is being depleted. They are constructing a lot. And Rojo Tavares just hopes that he can continue tending to his land. We will, yes, if we can get support to keep going and they don't leave us without any land to harvest. While farmers, Amazon employees, and other fulfillment services alike are all working to make a living out here, the real reason for the change is simple, consumer demand. We'll see how the landscape changes in the future along with people's buying needs. Jack Urios, NTD News, California. Amazon is hiring over 10,000 employees throughout Southern California for the holiday shopping season. A variety of positions are available online. Amazon is hiring for 10,000 warehouse jobs throughout Southern California, with 7,000 of them in the Inland Empire alone. The variety of positions include full-time, part-time, and seasonal roles. Amazon Senior Vice President of World Operations, John Felton, said that the holidays are a great time for people to join Amazon, and many seasonal employees return year after year or transition into full-time roles. Amazon plans to hire 150,000 employees in the holiday shopping season across the country. Researchers at Stanford developed a new kind of boot that can help people walk. The exoskeleton boot looks like something from Iron Man's suit out of the Marvel movies. A new study published on October 12th in the journal Nature shows a promising future for an untethered exoskeleton boot that could improve the lives of people suffering from mobility issues. This robotic boot, built at the Stanford Biomechatronics Laboratory in Stanford, brings together computers, sensors, and motors to assist wearers in walking faster while expending less energy. Exoskeleton is essentially a normal shoe with a piece that runs up the length of your calf that has a motor, and this motor winds a cable to help launch you as you're walking, so it helps you push off and actually turn off your calf muscles, which saves you energy and can also help you increase your walking speed. The sensor located at the back of the heel measures the force applied by the motor. An amplifier just above the ankle reads the sensor. Meanwhile, pressure sensors on the bottom will detect the heel strike and the push-off. Wearing the device is exciting. It feels like you have sort of a spring in your step that kind of launches you as you're walking and propels you forward. And at first it takes a bit getting used to, but after you've been using it for a while and you turn it off, you can really tell. According to the study, the boot allowed users to walk 9% faster while using 17% less energy. Researchers say the energy saved is roughly equivalent to removing a 30-pound backpack. The goal is to eventually get the boots onto the feet and legs of anyone who needs help moving. Among those, the researchers envisioned the boot potentially helping people with cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, or post-stroke. We want to help people 
uh, to do the things they want to do. And, and one of the most important aspects of life is mobility. The ability to get from one place to another just under your own power. And many people have disabilities that make that very challenging. And everyone, as they get older, slows down and finds walking more effortful. So we're developing exoskeletons that uh, make, keep walking easy and fast for all of us. One of the major achievements stems from the ability to personalize assistance for a person using the boot. And so we do this by looking at your motion, so your ankle angle, your ankle velocity, and the torque that we're applying to you. And we figure out by trying out different assistance conditions what's going to work best for you. And so by doing that, we can provide the best benefits possible for each person. Through the lab's extensive data collection, researchers developed a model that allows the boot to provide the user with an individualized assistance program to help maximize their efficiency. Some people may have taken up sewing and knitting during the last two years, making homemade masks during pandemic lockdowns or other household goods. But the art of sewing and quilting has a long tradition. I spoke to quilting connoisseurs on Friday to hear more. We're at the Pacific International Quilt Festival in Santa Clara, celebrating the art of quilting for the 31st anniversary. Now here we have this quilt that won Best of Show. And just from the look of it, you can see the amount of detail put into the quilt. This original design quilt is named Sweet Madam Blue, sewn by Margaret Gunn from Maine. It represents the culmination of patience and skill. David Mancuso, an antiques collector at heart and the man behind the quilt festival, says... It's very exciting to be a part of the quilting community and it's interesting how things have changed over the years. A lot of people will say that quilting is an American art but I'm not totally sure of that. You know, I think it's been around the world even before. Artists use a combination of machine and handwork. I think the quilting part, the stitching on the machine. Um, the, this is applique, this is applique. The festival is a hybrid event drawing in guests and artists from all over, including Australia and Japan. Mancuso says the Bay Area is really a respected gathering of a lot of quilters. It's a public show. It's open to the public for people to come out and, and enjoy shopping the vendors and also looking at hundreds of quilts, some of them in our, in our international competitions and some of them are also just special exhibits that travel around the world and around the country. The other aspect of the show is there's a learning aspect to the show. And we also offer workshops, seminars, lectures. We even have a fashion show. Uh, we have wearable art here. We have textile art and, of course, quilting art. Entries had to be stitched within the last three years. Mancuso showed off another quilt from a prize-winning quilter. You could see the tradition in it, the starburst, the applique. When you see this very thick applique like this, it's called trapunto. Okay, and it's, it's a very old, you know, people in the 18th century were using a trapunto in their quilting. So this is a great example of a traditional quilt. Lucy Mice, an attendee, is getting inspiration from the clothing as she likes sewing her own clothes. I think for me it's creativity and the uniqueness. I'm making it for me and I'm using the colors of fabrics that I like, uh, the patterns of fabrics that I like. She's been sewing since 1997. You can buy sweatshirts now and you can um, embellish those so it looks like a sweatshirt beautiful sweatshirt um, coat for yourself. This year, the festival runs from October 13th to Sunday, October 16th. It's open from 10 to 5 this Saturday and 10 to 4 on Sunday. David Lamb, Entity News, California.